All right. Now, let's get a lot more complicated here, okay? Now, there's another law, the law of independent assortment, okay? So we know that allele pairs separate from each other, right? We already learned that from the first law. How about Mendel's law of independent assortment, okay? What this means is that if you've got several traits, or at least two, okay, these allele pairs are going to segregate from each other independently, okay? Which means basically that they're not linked. So if you have two different traits and you've got a dominant allele for that trait and a recessive allele for the other trait, this law assumes that those genes are not linked in any way, okay? That they're not linked. That they separate from each other and independently, independent assortment. Okay, this is going to make more sense when I show you how to actually perform this independent assortment to figure out what, the, what alleles the gametes are going to carry. Okay, so we do this, we apply Mendel's law of independent assortment when we are tracking the inheritance of two traits at the same time. Okay, so you know that simple four box Punnett square I just showed you how to work problems with? We need a big 16 square Punnett square box to do this. Okay, this is the hardest type of problem that you guys will have to solve. Okay, so that's why I'm giving it to you now and not at the end of the lecture. All right, so let's talk about this. It's called a dye hybrid cross because dye means what? Two. two, two traits at the same time. So we need a dye hybrid cross. Now in this case, we're still dealing with flowers because they're easy. Pea plants and flowers. <coughs> okay, so we are starting with a parental, a true breeding parental generation. Okay, one parent has two dominant traits, round seeds that are yellow. Okay, round yellow seeds. The, for, for, for round, you need to have at least one big R. Okay. And then for yellow seeds, you have to have at least one big Y. That's the dominant trait, round yellow seeds. In this case, the parent is homozygous dominant for both of those traits, okay? That parent is breeding with a parent who is completely homozygous recessive for two traits, okay? Little r, little r will give you wrinkled seeds, and little y, little y will give you green seeds. Okay, but what's going to happen? Just like what happened when we crossed our purple and white flowers together, okay, what are you going to get? You're going to get offspring in the F1 who only look like one of those parents, right? Remember that? All heterozygous. In the F1 generation, only plants with round yellow seeds have been produced because you have at least one of each dominant allele. That would be the genotype that results from a cross between those two parents. Big R, little r, big Y, little y. Okay. You want to know why? Okay. Well, let's just do a really small little pun and square box before we get into the big one. I want to explain how this has happened. Okay. In a gamete, in a sperm or egg, you are only going to have one copy of an allele for each trait, okay? So if you're dealing with big R, big R, big Y, big Y, okay, you want to figure out what are the possible allele combinations in the gamete, okay? And to do this, we usually do something that we use in math called foiling. It's sort of similar to that. So we do this. We go, okay, this is going to connect to that. That's going to go to this. Then we go here. See where I'm going? A parent who has this genotype, homozygous dominant for two traits, will only be able to make gametes that have this combination, big R, big Y. Everything else is the same, right? Only one possible gamete combination. Same thing for the other parent who's little r, little r, little y, little y, right? If you do that, you're going to always get the same result. 
Okay. So if you wanted to see what would happen if you put these two gametes together, you could do a really kind of short little Punnett square box and say, okay, big R, big Y, little r, little y, and you can go big r, little r, big y, little y. Okay? That's unusual to have such a short little Punnett square box. That's only because one parent's completely homozygous dominant, the other parent's completely homozygous recessive. Okay? The fun begins with the 16 square Punnett square box when we want to now cross two of the offspring from the F1 generation together who both have this genotype, okay? So, if you have this genotype, big R, little r, big Y, little y, you gotta now figure out what allele combinations would end up in the gametes, all right? So, let me go ahead and erase this, or at least I'll move it over here, how about that, okay? So we are going to now conduct a big dihybrid cross between a big R, little r, big Y, little y, with another big R, little r, big Y, little y. So to do that, we're going to set up a big 16 square Punnett square box. So you draw a big box, put three lines down the middle and three lines horizontal. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and foil again so we can set up our Punnett square. We've got to figure out what alleles are going to be carried by the gametes. All right. So let's start off with this parent. All right. So we're going to go big R to big Y. And we'll put that one right here. Then we can go big R to little y. Then we'll go little r to big y and then little r to little y. Did you see that? Okay. So I've set up the gametes. Let's just say that that's the dad. I set up the possible combinations of alleles in all the different types of sperm that dad can make. He can make four different types of sperm right there. Okay. Now we've got to do the same thing for mom. But conveniently, she has the same exact genotype, okay? So, but we can FOIL again to make sure that we get the same consistent result. So we're going to say big R to big Y, big R to little y, little r to big y, and little r to little y. All right. So now help me fill it in. Guys, let's hear what you what you say should go in here. Okay? So what should go in here? What? Yeah, big R, big R, big Y, big Y. Okay? I'm going to keep on going, but think about what should be in these boxes cuz I got to get this done. It's going to take me a little bit. All right? So here we go. Big R, big R, big Y, little Y, right? Big R, little R. Big Y, big Y, big R, little r, big Y, little y. You got to be careful with your penmanship to make sure that you don't get a big and a little confused, okay? Or write it improperly. Here we got big R, big R, big Y, little y. Are you guys with me? Big R, big R, little y, little y. Big R, little r, big Y, little y. Big R, little r, little y, little y. Big R, little r, big Y, big Y. Big R, little r, big Y, little y. Little r, little r, big Y, big y. Little r, little r, big Y, little y. And big R, little r. Big Y, little y. Big R, little r, little y, little y. Little r, little r. Big Y, little uh, y. And last but not least, little r, little r, little y, little y. Whew, that's a lot of work. Okay. 
Now we have to interpret our results, okay? So let's figure that out. Now, I started out with two completely heterozygous parents, right? Both parents were heterozygous for two traits, okay? So just like how if you start with that with a monohybrid cross, you have a consistent phenotypic ratio, you are also going to have a consistent phenotypic ratio in this case as well. And in this case, it is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, just like it says in the slide, okay? Now let's figure out what that means and let's identify the genotypes that correspond to that ratio, okay? So basically though, just to let you know, that that means that nine out of, how many possible outcomes do we have here? 16, 16. nine out of 16 are gonna have both, homozygous well not necessarily homozygous, they're gonna have both dominant traits, but they could be homozygous or heterozygous, okay? So in fact, let's stop there and let's find them. Okay, that's a good segue. So let's look for the 9 out of 16 that are going to have both dominant traits, okay? And to have that, they have to have at least one copy of big R and at least one copy of big Y. The second letter does not matter, okay? So we're going to have both dominant traits, which was what, remember? Round yellow seeds, all right. So let's find them. So does this one work? Yes. yes. What about this one? No way, right? What about this one? No. Yes. Yes. Do we have nine? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine out of 16 are expected to have both dominant traits, round yellow seeds, okay? Now, we're going to have three out of 16 that we expect to be, to have one dominant trait and one recessive, okay? So let's say that They've got the dominant round trait, but they're going to have wrinkled, uh, they're going to have green seeds, green seeds, okay? So round seeds that are green, so one dominant trait, one recessive. So let's uh, find our three that fit this bill, okay? What about this one? Yes. How about this one? This one? There we go. Three out of 16. Dominant for the R gene, giving you round seeds, but recessive for the Y gene, giving you green seeds. Okay? Let's keep on going. We gotta find three more. In this case, it's going to be the opposite, where you have the recessive shape, wrinkled, but you're going to have the dominant color yellow, okay? So wrinkled yellow seeds. All right, so where are they? There's not much left. So what's this? Yes, that works. What about this one? Yes, how about this one? Yes, okay? So three out of 16 have the phenotype wrinkled yellow seeds. And then we have our one lonely one left, one that is 16, is completely homozygous recessive for both traits, giving you wrinkled green seeds. Okay? How do you like that? Was that fun? Oh, stop it. You'll get practice. Okay. The nine to three to three to one phenotypic ratio. But see, if you get asked on a test, what is the phenotypic, phenotypic ratio of two parents who have, you know, who are both big A, little B, big B, little B, okay? Big A, little A, big B, little B. What would you say? Nine to three to three to one. If they're both heterozygous, 
You don't have to do all that work. You already know what the answer is going to be. Okay? Think about that. All right. Here is another example that you could work just to give you guys some extra practice for over the weekend before we meet again on Tuesday to do more practice together. But you could always do a Punnett square with these different letters, big B, little b, big N, little n, okay, two parents with that genotype, and you should get the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio when dealing with the inheritance of coat color and blindness in dogs, okay? So try it out. All right, in this case, black is dominant to chocolate, and the blindness trait is recessive, okay? So only dogs that are little n, little n, two copies of the recessive gene are going to be blind. If you, if you have one big N, you're normal, okay? So I'm not going to do that again because it would just take too much time, okay? That's more practice for you guys to do at home. So do a cross with big B, big B, little N, little N, times a big B, little B, little N, big N, little N, and you should get the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio when you work it out, okay? Okay, now let me talk about some exceptions here. Linked genes do exist. And this was something that Mendel really did not know a whole lot about. Okay? Um, linked genes do actually exist. So it does kind of counter, it sort of counters his law of independent assortment. In some cases, genes do not separate in independently of each other. Okay? In some cases, they are linked. And this experiment that was performed by Bateson and Punnett, Punnett, who the Punnett square, was named, was, who, who was basically the reason for the naming of the Punnett Square, found an example of the inheritance of plants and plant traits in which actually there was gene linkage. And that defied Mendel's law of independent assortment and defied the predicted 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio. Okay? So in this case, they had parents where one plant had both dominant traits. Okay? Uh, purple flowers and long pollen cross two plants that had the recessive traits of red flowers, round pollen. And sort of ironically, in the second generation, you didn't have the 9331. Instead, the majority of the F2 generation did have both dominant traits, but the second most abundant characteristic, the second most common characteristic, was both recessive traits. Okay? red flowers, round pollen. So the dominant alleles in this case were linked together and the recessive alleles were linked together. All right, so that defied Mendel's law of independent assortment. You will not have to solve problems with gene linkage though, okay? But this was the outcome of their experiment. So if law, Mendel's law of independent assortment held up to be true, this is what we should have gotten according to the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, okay? But we didn't. This was what was observed from the cross between those two parents, okay? That yes, the majority of the offspring did have both dominant traits, but the second most abundant characteristic was both recessive traits, right? Whereas according to 9 3 3 1, both recessive traits should be the most rare, okay? So that's just a little exception. And just as an extra sort of way to go after these, this thing I'm talking about, um, linked alleles though, the benefit, the, the huge benefit of meiosis, which leads to genetic variety and diversity, is because of crossing over. Crossing over can separate linked alleles. Okay? And let me ask you this, when does crossing over happen? During what phase of meiosis? What? Prophase what? One. Prophase one. Due to crossing over, which happens at prophase one, that will actually separate linked alleles. Crossing over can separate linked alleles and can lead to genetic variation and diversity. Okay. Now, 
before I start getting into more problems that you guys can figure out how to solve, just one more thing is what a genetic map looks like. This is a genetic map. It shows you the location of a certain trait on a chromosome and how, how close in proximity they are to other traits, other gene loci. Okay, And basically, what is depicted here are recombination frequencies, which really shows you what is the chance that these alleles will be separated from each other in crossing over to produce a recombinant. Okay, Let me just go back to the previous slide. This is a recombinant right here. This is the result of crossing over. This is the result of crossing over. These are recombinants. Okay? So this slide, want, this next slide show, is wanting to ask, what is the frequency of recombination happening? Okay? Basically, if they are farther apart on the chromosome, they have less of a chance of being inherited together and the greater 17% recombination frequency. Okay, they have a higher chance of being separated by crossing over. Okay, if they are closer together on the chromosome, okay, they tend to have a lower recombination frequency. Okay, a lower chance of being separated by crossing over. Okay, so genes that are located close together on chromosomes tend to be inherited together. The further apart they are, the more likely they are to be separated by crossing over. Okay.